<coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is the second day of Photonics Plus. This event that we're organizing just before summer. So you finish the year, the academic year, with a nice feeling of bringing you in touch with nice potential customers, suppliers, and partners. In this meeting, on the beginning of the second day, if this was a meeting present, face to face, I would ask everyone to raise their hand if they already made a lead that they want to follow up with. Today is a virtual event, so I'm feeling that everyone is actually virtually raising their hand right now. Please keep doing that. This meeting is about connecting. My name is Jose Pozo. I'm chairing the keynote session. We have fantastic keynote speakers. Today, we actually do have end users and integrators. We are focusing on those, trying to understand what are their needs. And I'm going to start with something quite spectacular. We're starting with a company focused on OCT, Optical Coherence Tomography, acquired by Nikon a few years back. Optos PLC is a company that has focus on retina imaging with optical coherence tomography and representing Optos PLC, Jano Van Hemet. Jano, Huye Medag, thank you very much for being with us. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to Scotland, goes to you. Good evening, Jose. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Welcome to my presentation on photonics trends and ophthalmic diagnostics. I'll try to be as energetic as Jose. Let's see how far we get. Um, first of all, I am actually not an expert on photonics. And, and, and second of all, uh, I will present much of this through the lens of the products we developed by Doctors. These types of products are commonplace in eye care, but many other product types exist. And, and I will not include all of those here. I will merely explain the trends and provide requirements of photonics. 20 minutes really doesn't do uh, the ophthalmic uh, history of 150 years the justice that it deserves. <clears throat> in the chat, and, and this is my little interactive bit that I normally do in front of an audience. In the chat, can you please say yes if you have heard of Optos before this presentation and no if you have not heard of Optos before this presentation. Um, and I'm going to watch that, uh, that little chat window here. And I hope there's, there's people out there. That's very good. I, I can actually see some yeses, so I'm, I'm surprised. We, we are not a very, uh, in a market that's very visible to, to people generally, but there's a plenty of no's. So there's my, my next question then. So I'll, um, I'll, I'll write uh, next question so that we, we can move on. In the chat, can you please say yes, if you've heard of the company that you can see in the, in the top yellow box there of this presentation. And can you type no if you've never heard of that company before? And that company is called Nikon. Yeah, I can see that. So all the yeses are now flowing in. Um, but that's good because that means I've got something new to say to you at least. Um, you, you will know Nikon for consumer cameras, but you probably did not know Nikon started a healthcare division in 2015 and purchased Optos to start of it, to, to actually start its medical imaging journey. <clears throat> so what did they buy? Well, Optus has 19,000 medical devices called ophthalmoscopes installed worldwide. And they would typically image around uh, 2 million eyes a day. On the left of the slide, there are devices that we sell for optometrists. These are the Daytona and the Monaco. And on the right are uh, California and Silverstone. And these are devices we sell to ophthalmologists who are certified to perform diagnostics that involve injections and that those injections bear a risk to the patient. Our California device can be ordered with specific imaging modalities, and the lightest model is also suitable for opt optometry. Hence, it is slightly over the line towards optometry. At the top of the slides are devices without optical coherence tomography, and, and I know Jose is a fan of, uh, of OCT, and below devices with op optical coherence tomography, which I will shorten to OCT from now on because it's quite a mouthful. OCT enables eye care practitioners to get depth information of the retina and produce 3D imaging images of the back and the front of the eye. These are the imaging modalities supported by our devices. Our flagship model, Silverstone, supports all of these modalities. At the top left is the most prevalent form of imaging of the retina. Our devices scan two combined laser beams across the back of the eye, which are collected in separate photon avalanche detectors to form an image of about 12 million pixels. It does all of this in less than 0.4 seconds. 
The red free is the result of the green laser only. Red free is a term formed from old cameras that use filters. Choroidal is the return of the red laser. It goes deeper into the back of the eye. The next row shows fluorescence. The first is autofluorescence and is supported by all our models. The next two, fluorescing angiography and indocyanine green, require an injection into the arm of the patient with a fluorescent dye. A blue and near infrared laser is used to excite the dye in the retina, respectively. The bottom row finally shows a wide field OCT B scan for the optic nerve head and the fovea of a patient. It is a cut through of the retina where the top layers are close to the retina and the bottom layers are close to the brain. Optos ophthalmoscopes are famous for producing the widest field of view. Here you can see several images of the same patient in one view. The view is our picture and archiving communication system called Optos Advanced. Our practitioners use a web browser to access Optos Advanced and make a diagnosis or refer a patient for a second opinion. Optus has 30 years experience in retinal diagnostic imaging. More recently, it has started to offer other diagnostic products such as Adaptive, AdaptDX to diagnose age-related macular degeneration, which is one of the most prevalent eye diseases in the developed world. Optus first medical device for treatment is called Faleda. It is the world's first treatment for dry age-related macular degeneration. Dry age-related macular degeneration or dry AMD is the precursor to wet AMD. Once a patient has wet AMD, they will need continuous monitoring and expensive treatment to prevent them from going blind. By combining early detection with early treatment in the dry AMD phase, we can keep the vision of the patient for longer. So that my, concludes my summary of, of Optos and what we do. Uh, and now going into the, the history of eye imaging. Now, I cannot cover the long and rich history of the eye healthcare imaging in, in the short amount of time here. Instead, I've chosen one specific parameter that a field of view, which determines how much of the retina is captured. So almost 170 years ago, the first retinal image was taken. It had little detail in a tiny field of view and it took minutes. <clears throat> Not until 1926, the first product appeared. In the decades that followed, the field of view increased slowly. But then in 1997, a large jump was achieved in field of view to 130 degrees. Only a few years later, Optos made another large jump to 200 degrees. Until today, that is the largest field of view for single images. In 2015, Optos released a software product that by automatically montaging images from different angles, can derive a 230 degree field of view. That is the entire retina and therefore the end of the line. The history of optical coherence tomography, so OCT in ophthalmology is much shorter at only 30 years. However, it has had seen an enormous amount of innovation in those years. It has also been a key technology to push quantification into eye care. There are too many parameters to put on one slide. I will give a few highlights. The first retinal OCT image was published in 1991 using time domain OCT. A few years later, using the same technique, the first product came to the US market. Time domain is very slow. And in 2006, the transition to spectral domain, also known as frequency domain OCT, started. Most devices installed today are spectral domain. In 2016, the first third generation swept source OCT product entered the US market. The benefits of swept source over spectral domain are more difficult to explain. Swept source is expensive and although it potentially may be faster than spectral domain, commercially these technologies are still very close. There's, there's a complicated relationship between cost, speed, resolution, signal to noise and depth of imaging. In 2019, Optos released Silverstone, a wide field OCT device that enables a 23 millimeter scan, which is a huge leap over the first image you can see here from 1991. As with many global market reports, the answer is often um, there are several billions. The actual estimate depends much on what product types are included and whether there's a focus such as a retina, thereby excluding cornea only products. The main message I have from this slide is that ophthalmic diagnostic imaging, although a small part of the eye care market, still is a global market of several billion. The largest part of eye health care comprises pharmaceuticals, such as the drugs needed to treat wet AMD. So after that very brief historical overview, I will go into a very simplified future trends in eye imaging. Again, I will not have time to go into a comprehensive analysis. 
I've selected several trends and parameters that are clear drivers behind product improvement. I will talk separately about funders imaging and OCT imaging. In, a, in funders imaging, I see two trends. The first <clears throat> introduces the inevitable artificial intelligence, the first medical device for automatically diagnosis of def deferrable, referable diabetic retinopathy from funders images was approved in 2018 by the FDA in the US. I do not see much of a role in photonics here, except for making devices smaller and cheaper to make access wider to the full pipeline of image to automatic AI diagnosis. Note that AI will also play an important role in OCT. Several companies are taking steps to get closer to market approval. The second is multimodal imaging and novel imaging methods, such as fluorescent lifetime imaging, which are all in premature stages of clinical acceptance. Here, the photonics opportunity is to create bespoke solutions depending on the need of those modalities. If we move to OCT, here in the center, I, I've put the guiding message for the trend. So, and that message is obtain the most information within the safe limit of energy to the eye in the shortest time possible for an affordable cost. What I will not go into are all the specific types of OCT imaging and the technologies associated. Instead, I focus here on the general trend and the fact more and more data needs to be captured. The trends are higher actual resolution, increased imaging depth, increased field of view, and support for new modalities that often require even more data to be captured. Ophthalmic imaging is limited by standards that dictate how much light we can point at and into the eye. Although our type of products vary much in market price, there's not much scope for large increases. <clears throat> Another challenge in ophthalmic imaging is eye movement, which is a problem at different levels from small saccades in tens of milliseconds to large eye movements such as drifting and loss of focus that are in the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Short captures are important also for reducing the time required to see each patient. We only have a few minutes for each patient. So important trends for photonics you know, CT are increases in speed of capture, bandwidth, and coherence length. These are indications of parameters that our industry is looking for. The precise target will vary depending on the unique selling point and the modalities that must be supported. I've chosen values that I've seen used to achieve academic results. In other words, th these targets have been achieved and they have been demonstrated in human eyes. However, for now, the cost of combined components needed to achieve these targets are simply too high to create viable products in this market. So the real challenge is how to get these performance targets within a reasonable cost and reasonable size. That brings me nearly to the end of my presentation. Optos is a company that thrives on innovation. It has recognized early that this innovation cannot be done in isolation. We collaborate with many partners in industry, universities and hospitals to pioneer new technology and assess its performance with patients. Here's a list that gives an indication of how active we are in public collaborations. With many, many students um, who undertake projects with us, but also we collaborate in publicly funded uh, research proposals such as EU proposals or Innovate UK proposals. And that often leads to publications, both technical and uh, medical journals looking for performance of um, technology and, and inevitably um, how that technology performs in diagnosis diseases. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, please do email me or hang around here uh, or indeed type something in that chat box and then uh, we can start answering those questions. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Very much, Jano. We have a lot of viewers. When you ask, it took a bit of time to answer because I guess there is like a 30 second delay. They told me that the organizers ah. but we have a lot of viewers in the room. Uh, yes, indeed. I'm a huge fan of what you're doing. And thank you so much for a great, great presentation. For me, the big challenge in uh, OCT is choosing the right source. The right light source. That's the that's the, the first step one. And all the companies that I see in OCT, they take different approaches for choosing the right light source for the for the tomography. Uh, do, can you share some light on that? Is a, is a superluminescent diode the, the right the right light source? We, do we need broader broader tunable? Uh, what is what is in your opinion the the, the 
the right the light the light source of choice for OCT? Well, a very broader certainly. Um, we see a, a, a big trend towards that, and, and that will really give us the actual resolution that we need. Um, we just finished uh, an EU project um, where we tried to get to a, a bandwidth of 300 nanometers, which would give us a, a resolution in, in the retina of just above one uh, micro. And that is needed for um, monitoring particular diseases such as glaucoma, where a very small uh, thinning of the, of the back of the eye uh, needs to be monitored uh, over, over months, sometimes years. And that really is the indication to understand if, if this uh, patient needs to be treated or not. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, increased um, resolution, therefore increased uh, uh, bandwidth is, is, is one of the key drivers there. Uh, another one is, is which particular wavelength you, uh, uh, you want to go for. Uh, a lot of uh, commercial OCT will be either around the, the 800, 850 nanometers uh, or the 1300 nanometers. Um, or, or the 1050. So um, that, that gives you different uh, penetrations uh, and different scattering and so on. So it, it, it really depends on the actual clinical application that that particular company is going for. For us, it's often the retina. Uh, and, and so um, our latest one is a, is a 1050, for example. Yeah, no, do me a favor. Stop sharing the screen because I want to. Oh, yeah, I want sorry. us to be together a, a little bit more because I'm already getting very nice questions from the public. We have a few minutes for a nice discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on on this slide over here. I think it is truly fantastic. And here you are talking about the about the scan rate. 1.8 megahertz for the scanning rate to reduce the movement of the cornea. Mm -hmm. You're talking about your demands for the bandwidth. I'm gonna I'm gonna use this slide already a lot, but with this slide in mind, we have uh, already some people in the room with questions. The first one is from a company in Hamburg. The company is called Valo Innovation. They make 40 femtosecond lasers, mm -hmm. and he has a question for you. Uh, the CEO, Oliver Prosnow, asks, can you use a femtosecond supercontinuous laser source with flat spectrum and bandwidth of more than 400 nanometers? He's asking you because he has it. Well, yes, I assume so. <laughs> that sounds incredible, 400 nanometers. I, I think, yes, I mean, the, the question is always how much is this going to cost, right? I mean, um, uh, we, we did... Um, the project that we did in the EU, we, we got the 300 nanometers with a supercontinuum laser, and and had, we had you know very good results there. Um, but but we also realised that a supercontinuum laser is really really expensive and and really really big and has a big uh, power consumption as well. Uh, and so turning that into a commercial entity, I mean, it was a fantastic prototype, but turning it into a commercial entity uh, is is really the key here. So. The question is, how much does it cost? How small can we make it? Can we integrate it into one of our devices? But yeah, I mean, it's certainly something interesting to look at. Yeah, no, it is not the first time that you mention cost, and it puzzles me. Mm. Because because this is medical instrumentation. It's not supposed to be cheap. You are not talking about wearables ah. here. So why, why is it so cost that important? I mean, that's cheap. And, and I think you have to really look at the at the actual medical market. Now, if I was sitting here and, and I would be selling uh, MRI scanners or PET scanners, yeah, of course. I mean, that we can we can put quite an expensive component in there, but but here we're looking at uh, at optometrists, right? And so you you have to think about how much does an optometrist earn, uh, what kind of equipment they have, and how much can they uh, afford, really? And um, you're realistically uh, sitting at instruments that are somewhere between twenty thousand and and maybe in, you know in the ultimate really uh, all kitted out super hospital, they they may be able to spend two hundred thousand. Uh, dollars on it, but but it's in that range that you you have to stay. So you you cannot just keep adding really more expensive components to it. Um, people are just not able to afford that in in the healthcare setting. Also, you have to realize that um, uh, the healthcare systems in many countries are under much pressure and uh, to, to actually reduce costs to be able to to deal with the the, the numbers of of people that they have to see. So, I'm gonna come back to you on the cost in a second, but before that, mm -hmm. I have a question from one of our biggest experts in supercontinuum generation, the company NKT Photonics in Denmark. Yes, of course. Tom Holm has a question. Tom, by the way, he's one of our biggest experts in super resolution microscopy as well. Tom Holm asks, have you considered using supercontinuous laser as a light source for multimodal imaging? It's related to the previous one. 
Considered, yes. Have we done it? No. I mean, we've, we've never actually uh, produced one where, um, where we did that. But I've seen others do it, and, uh, but we, we as a company have not done it. But, but it's certainly something that is worth investigating. I have to say that it is medical imaging and you have to realize that people are very conservative. And so if, if you build something and it's slightly different wavelength and so on, there's a lot of convincing to do uh, that, that this is meaningful. But um, yeah, we, we could certainly look at it. What I'm seeing as a trend in the industry for OCT is that they are using, they try to, uh, and, they, and by they I mean you and others, they try to use tunable lasers uh, that are uh, sometimes using telecom applications and putting in OCT. And what they don't understand, and what, I, what I, for me passes me, is that mode hoping here is a killer. If you have any kind of, of no transition, no constant tuning, uh, you, we are just playing with people's eyes. And for me, that, that's super worrisome. When you talk about the cost, we are talking about 200K for an instrument. Isn't the laser the, 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 the most important regarding the security, regarding the, the, the applicability, regarding the, the imaging tolerance? Isn't the laser the, the place where you should spend most of that budget? <laughs> yeah, um, good, good, good try. So, I mean, it certainly takes up a big chunk of the budget. I will not deny that. But, but um, uh, one of the key things uh, that we're selling here is, is the ability to get light in and out of the eye uh, and, and to do something useful with the information that's coming out of that. So uh, some chunk will go to, to the optics, you know, and, and um, indeed, if you go to old cameras, if you go to old Sanders camera, you, you're buying um, just optics and then you, you click in an, an old, uh, not an old, but, but a really kind of, fancy consumer camera into it. Uh, and, and so the, the added value of the, uh, the, the medical device is literally everything around that consumer camera. Um, and, and so you can see there's quite a lot of added value in being able to get the, the, the actual uh, laser into the eye and, and getting the data out in such a way that it can be processed. So uh, but there's a lot required in there as well. Uh, really fast cards to be able to process the data. Uh, all the optical elements um, uh, to deal with. Uh, and then, of course, the, also software is becoming increasingly more uh, important and expensive to, to, to maintain. I'm a huge fan of super continuous lasers, and I think I want to see them more often in, in, in ophthalmology mm -hmm. applications. For me, one thing that always uh, puzzles me is when a company like Optus is really super innovative, every time that you try a new laser, for you, this is this is a big deal because you need to go through all the validation, qualification, and certification of the new product. How is it to, to integrate a, a new laser source into the? How, how, how is it? How difficult it is to get all the different approvals from the ISO to the FDA? Um, that depends. I mean, if 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 you are literally replacing a, a laser with something similar, then then we just have to do all the checks. With the FDA. Um, really just checks whether we have followed our own processes. So it, it's our own processes. Um, uh, and, and yes, there's some guidance from the FDA what those processes should look like. Uh, and when they audit us, they just come and check whether we have the right processes and we actually follow the right processes. So it's not that the FDA says you have to, when you change the laser, you must do it this way. You know, when, when, when uh, the FDA just says, have you got a process in place for when you want to change the laser? Yes. Are you following it? Yes. Okay. Very good. We assume that that's good enough. Um, but uh, it, it gets a bit more difficult when we start talking about different wavelengths and the different bandwidths, so, because the, the, um, one of the key things we have to comply with is, uh, eye safety and, uh, and, and you know, the shorter the wavelength, the, uh, the, the more stringent, uh, the limit is going to be. And so we have to deal with that aspect as well. And, and one of the key problems is to get enough light into the retina and back again. So it's the power to the eye that is often the problem. So if it gets too short, then it's really difficult to get sufficient signal to noise out. Yeah, no, there are many people who want to talk to you. The organizers are telling me that we're out of time. So I would like to say oh, no. first, yeah. thank you all for the Moji Presentatsi. Thank yeah. you very much for, for being with us today. It was truly, truly fantastic. I had a lot of fun talking to you. I want to do this in a longer, longer time.